All right, new section from an interesting perspective, I think. It's a rather cool way to study high-altitude physiology from the point of view of the uh, first major scientific expedition to Mount Everest. Not the first mountaineering expedition, but the first real systematic attempt to understand what happens to your body at altitude, specifically the most extreme altitude on the ter uh, terrestrial surface. So we will approach this as uninformed individuals with no understanding of, of what goes on at altitude and then figure out how the body responds to high altitude exposure, specifically hypoxia. I kind of like this, uh, this section. I, I tend to like to climb tall things. These are a selection of different mountain peaks that I've, for some, some reason I decided to bike up in Hawaii, which was nuts. Um, this is Mount Whitney, California, highest peak in the continental U.S. Mount Elbert in Colorado, second highest peak in the continental U.S. And Thailand in the mix, um, just for a bit of flavor. But none of these even come close to the kind of high altitude physiology that we're going to talk about. So 4,400 meters is 14,500 feet ish. We're going to try to use meters throughout, but 14,500 feet, if that makes more sense to you, 14,400 feet, um, 10,000 feet, and 8,400 feet. So in comparison to the stress that we're looking at, which is base camp and the eventual summit to Mount Everest, these pale in comparison. 4,400 uh, meters is not even base camp. 5,300 meters is base camp. So we're down here on my highest expedition, and I can tell you the, the feeling of slogging to the top of that peak after walking for it was 12 hours that day was just mind-bendingly numb. Like I just, you, you shamble like a zombie up the last uh, few inclines. So not even arriving at base camp at that point, I can't imagine making this trek three kilometers up, two and a half, no, three, three and a half kilometers up after reaching base camp. Just unfathomable. So we are going to look at um, physiological responses at sea level and then at a few tiered elevations from base camp upwards. And uh, the, the major expedition that we're going to look at set up camp here, 6,400 meters, which is where um, the Silver Hut was set up, and that's the, uh, the laboratory for this series of experiments. So there were measurements at base camp, at the Silver Hut at 6,400 meters, one in the middle here somewhere, and then they would make uh, brief ascents to 7,400 meters to do a few uh, measurements and come back down. This was about as high as they were able to comfortably live for longer periods of time. Venturing upwards from there was only a short-lived uh, experience. So we're going to live here for a little while <clears throat> on this ice flow in theory. Also note the, uh, the South Col. The South Col is uh, something that we'll come back to a couple times as well, 8,000 meters, but Still a fair ways off the peak. You'd round that to a kilometer uh, away from the peak still. So in this section, we are going to start from the ground up and first of all characterize altitude. Okay, we know it's a high elevation, but what does that mean physiologically? <laughs> okay. A lot, we're, we're actually quite lucky to have a lot of really good data in the field on the mountain. So we have direct observational data on the mountain and we're going to compare that to simulated altitude in the laboratory. So we can create this situation in a lab after we understand what characterizing altitude is we just need to figure out how to change pressure, 
in oxygen concentrations in the air, and we can make this happen in the lab. It's pretty straightforward. Um, using these two different approaches, we get a good sense of the whole body response, but it's difficult, for instance, to take metabolic measurements on the side of a mountain. Imagine taking a muscle biopsy. When you're fearing for your life that the crag you just crawled over might crack open or the ladder that you, you have to cross to get to your, uh, your laboratory might fall, difficult, um, lots of risk of infection, um, probably a stressful situation added on top of a stressful situation. So we can use a, a combination of these approaches to understand the entire response the whole body performance response, changes in the blood, and then changes in the muscle at the metabolic level to this uh, altitude stress. And then knowing all of this that we're going to uh, evaluate in this section, next chapter is going to try to leverage these adaptations at a lower, more manageable altitude. So live high, train low, live high, train high. Those types of paradigms to uh, exploit the adaptive mechanisms to altitude for use in sport. Not necessarily blood doping or EPO administration, but uh, natural altitude exposure or periodic exposure and how that can uh, bring about favorable changes that allow you to uh, excel um, in sporting competition. So that's coming next. We're not focusing on that right now. We're just from a blank slate looking at what happens when you move to altitude? Or what happens if you live at altitude for a while? You could argue that this is performing, and it probably is. So there might be an element of this as we get uh, into the later stages. So characterizing altitude. Characterizing what it means to be at a high elevation. There is a lack of a fundamental nutrient in the body, and that is oxygen. And all cellular respiration relies on this oxygen cascade. We need to have a gradient from outside to the deepest foundations of our cells. That oxygen will flow downwards, and we can use it to create energy. Oxygen will only flow according to its gradient, and specifically its partial pressure gradient. So this should be review from a &P. It's not a concentration gradient. It's not a pressure gradient, total atmospheric pressure, but it's a combination of those two ideas that describes partial pressure. And the name really identifies what it is that we're looking at. So of the total air pressure, there's a mix of gases in the room right now. It's mostly nitrogen, 78, 79% nitrogen. We have about 21% oxygen and then a fraction of CO2 with a few other gases thrown in. Now total atmospheric pressure, you can measure and you get a number in millimeters of mercury or kilopascals. The total weight of all of the air pushing down on you right now. But that pressure, total pressure, is due to the individual pressures of all the gases added up. So of that total pressure, nitrogen makes up a fraction of that. Of that total pressure, oxygen makes up a fraction of that. Of that total pressure, CO2 makes up a fraction. And it's that fraction that we're interested in. So total atmospheric pressure here at sea level might be 760 millimeters of mercury in that area. The fraction of that pressure due to oxygen is 160 millimeters of mercury. 21% of the total atmospheric pressure is the partial pressure of oxygen. This is our starting point in the best cases. The best case scenario being um, at sea level in normal room air. This is where we start. That's what drives oxygen into the body. 
eventually down all the way to near zero at the mitochondria. So we follow this gradient from outside into the lungs, from the lungs into the blood, from the blood into the tissue, from the tissue down to the mitochondria, and then we use oxygen to make energy. And we need that to live. Altitude compromises that entire gradient. It makes it harder to live. Now, we're going to think of altitude as anything over 3,000 meters in this case, or 10,000 feet. That's a nice, clean, round number where we can cut off exposure. Below this is still altitude exposure, but it's moderate altitude. We're not concerned with moderate or mild altitude right now. We're concerned with high altitude exposure, high altitude physiology, over 10,000 feet or over 3,000 meters. This, incidentally, is the last known photo of uh, Mallory and Irvine, the first two climbers to attempt to summit Mount Everest in 1924. They were still of the, um, the old British mountaineering pedigree that all you really need is toughness, although they did start to come around to the idea that supplemental oxygen was vital and or necessary or at least really helpful in, uh, in their attempts to summit the mountain. They, of course, did not make it. <laughs> and um, the first successful attempt happened 30 years later in 1953, which a lot of the fellows, the scientists that we'll talk about today, were, were a part of uh, that expedition to help make sure that it succeeded. So 3,000 meters or 10,000 feet, what does that mean in the context of what we know at sea level where we live and what uh, Mount Everest looks like? So these are a few different tiers or levels, uh, a few examples of what altitude might look like. And notice that as the gradient is compromised, it's not an effect of the percentage of oxygen changing. When people say you go to altitude and there's little oxygen around, that's, that's not right there's still about 21% oxygen in the air that you're breathing. At sea level, 21%. At 4,000 meters, 21%. At 9,000 meters, Mount Everest um, altitudes, 21%. The problem is in the barometric pressure. The total atmospheric pressure drops. Therefore, the partial pressure of each individual gas drops. And we don't care about the other gases so much, but we certainly care about the partial pressure of oxygen. And the partial pressure of oxygen drops from the 160 that we calculated at sea level down to a measly 48 at the summit of Mount Everest. And if we were just to teleport ourselves to the top of Mount Everest, this would all of a sudden be our starting point for the oxygen cascade in the body, 48 millimeters of mercury. Do you remember offhand what arterial PO2 should be? Ballpark? It's 160 in the air we're breathing, and that drives oxygen into the lungs, and there's a little bit of a gradient from the alveoli into the blood. What's the arterial PO2? If you were to ballpark it, would it be around 48 or 50? Would you say higher, lower? It has to be below 160, right? Or there's no gradient. It's okay if you don't remember. It's about 100. Really nice, easy, round number to remember. Arterial PO2, around 100 millimeters of mercury. So we could probably survive without too much trouble somewhere between 2,000 meters in Mexico City. Not too much trouble. It would take a little while to adapt. There's a very small gradient from the air uh, 
into the body, which might compromise arterial PO2 a bit. If we move to Mount Everest, all of a sudden the gradient reverses. There's essentially O2 coming out of the arterial side and, and leaving the body going to the environment. So this is a pretty serious complication. This is around the PO2 of venous blood. After the arterial blood sends oxygen to the tissues, and the tissues extract it to make energy and survive, they leave about this much oxygen in venous blood. So that's, that's a pretty remarkable starting point. It's pretty remarkable that people have summited, period, and a few select individuals have summited without supplemental oxygen, which is nuts, I think. So not percent O2, it's not low oxygen, it is that the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, um, is compromised. And that makes sense. The total weight of all of the air around you is lower. You've removed half of the air that's pressing down on the surface of the Earth. As you move to altitude, the column that extends above your head into space is that much smaller. There's that much less air. Fewer air particles weighing down on you. Less atmospheric pressure. If we were to draw this to scale, Mount Everest would be somewhere around here as well. This is a nice little cartoon, but don't forget this last jump is pretty large, more than double, 4,000 to 9,000 meters in altitude. So it's, it's a pretty impressive summit. And then for context, if we were to place my summits on this graph, they'd be in this general area. Pretty mild, pretty bland boring altitudes, comparatively. Um, what about Everest? I think it's worth not paying homage, but uh, understanding the, the gravity of the situation a little bit as we approach this topic. This is a, a plot of the deaths on Mount Everest. It's a serious situation, being that it's a pretty pretty extreme physiological stress. 48 millimeters of mercury as a starting PO2 is, is not something that is survivable in most cases. So Mallory and Irvine over here made it pretty far, but not quite the summit. The first successful attempt is 1953, which is the expedition that we're looking at uh, in this section. And since then, just the, the density of, of dots with climbers versus Sherpas, and they're all mixed together. It's, a, it's sort of a, a group effort. But just the density of dots typifies how it's, there's sort of an economic boom on Mount Everest. It's now just churning out people trying to climb the summit. And it's not that it's become any safer. We have this understanding of what happens when you move to altitude. It's just that more people do it and there are uh, facilities and routes in, in place that allow frequent summits. Maybe you've seen Everest, the movie that was out, what was it, three, four years ago? They did a pretty good job of highlighting some of the physiology. And the, uh, <clears throat> there's the 1996 disaster where you see a nice little cluster in here. And this fellow, Suwang Paljur, is uh, affectionately referred to as Green Boots on the mountain. He died of exposure half actually trying to get down. He was wearing green ski boots, strapped on skis to try to get down the mountain. And I don't know if it was exposure or an avalanche, but now he's used as a marker. When you reach green boots, turn left. <coughs> That's this fellow up here from the, the 1996 disaster. <coughs> So, pretty perilous situation. And it's perilous everywhere. There are more clustered near the summit, but it's equally dangerous down here at base camp. This is not an altitude to scoff at, I don't think. How do individuals die? Uh, during the ascent, simply in preparing the routes, the ice flow always shifts and changes, so you need to place um, ladders and fix ropes. And then there's 
um, congestion. Nowadays, more than ever, as, as many groups try to reach the summit at once, and that was highlighted in that Everest movie pretty nicely. I'm trying to figure out what other deaths means. Avalanche, yeah, that's understandable. If you fall off, sure. Exposure, frostbite, mountain sickness, these are all consequences of uh, the cold and or of really low oxygen. Maybe this is a heart attack or some other predetermined disease. Most of the exposure type or altitude type deaths are, are encompassed in these other four, but natural causes we'll think of other as. <clears throat> so let's take a look at some of the original video in preparation for this ascent. We're going to follow along with this group as they get ready and talk about some of the ways that they prepare, they climatize. We'll look at some of the different types of equipment that they use as we go through and uh, try to make our way up the mountain. the ninth attempt to climb the mountain. Sir John Hunt has well said, every expedition climbs on the backs of its predecessors, and this expedition was no exception. In addition, it had the widest possible scientific backing. A survey of physiological and medical problems above 20,000 feet had been made the year before on a training expedition. Contributions to solving the problems raised were made by a large number of people in laboratories and workshops throughout the country. The problems were not only those of oxygen lack, but included cold, sickness, and perhaps most important, food and fluid intake. <coughs> the party reached Tangboche after a 17-day march. The composite ration, like service assault rations, had been taken to avoid the sudden change to a bulky, unaccustomed native diet. This was packed in 13 man day units with seven menus and was supplemented later on with fresh meat, eggs and potatoes. For the next month, the party explored the surrounding mountains in order to get acclimatized. Acclimatization is most important. Parties who go too high too quickly deteriorate physically at an early stage. A preliminary acclimatization period also gives climbers time to get over attacks of diarrhea and respiratory infections resulting from contact with the local Sherpa population. In the past, assault parties have been decimated at critical stages by infections of this kind. So, highlights the, um, the holistic approach that they're trying to take. You gotta have to get over like traveler's diarrhea or traveler's indigestion as well. You're in a foreign part of the country bring your own food and try to maintain a standard diet to minimize that. Um, this fellow here is actually Sir Edmund Hillary, the, uh, the first, one of the first two people to successfully summit on this expedition, Mount Everest. And this is uh, coming a year after a failed expedition in 1952. So they, they didn't have the scientific uh, backing that they did on this attempt. And they couldn't make the summit. They failed and turned around. So a year later, you saw some of the advances that uh, they're making in, in vacuum-sealed food and trying to fix um, some of the boilers and deal with food intake, which is a very large problem we'll talk about later. And coming back with a better understanding of the, the physical demands, even though Hunt, this fellow in charge, is a, a fairly religious fanatic that begrudgingly accepts the scientific element on this expedition. He was much more of the old school, just climb, be tough, don't worry about it, you'll make it if you make it, but begrudgingly accepts the help of some of the scientists on board. Um, what else did I want to mention? What's really funny is after this, uh, that last failed expedition, searching for grant money, it's not easy at this point in time to find money to summit Mount Everest and to run um, a scientific expedition. So the funds come from a grant which um, a few of these fellows wrote to track Yeti, to evaluate the existence of Yeti, to see if 
they lived at altitude on Mount Everest. So there's the secondary um, scientific spin to a mythological, um, a mythological expedition. The majority of their funds are to, uh, to study and track Yeti at altitude, and then they're going to do some science along the way, which is kind of interesting. So spending a month, um, not at base camp yet, but you saw the, the span of Everest in the background, to acclimatize, because if you go up too quickly, um, you compromise some of the physiological responses. So let's look at what the responses are. After you acclimatize and move up, what are the things that happen? What are the demands imposed on the climbers as they climb Mount Everest? And a lot of what we're going to look at are uh, results from the Silver Hut series of experiments, which are actually in 1960. So these are published and collected years after, but the same complement of scientists that were on the successful 1953 expedition are those that published the results in 1960. So it's as though they observed everything initially during the first successful attempt and then went back to get robust, conclusive data in 1960 by uh, trekking up this, this portable laboratory which gives the name to the series of expeditions, the Silver Hut, which is perched at 74 or 7,400 meters. So we know what is compromised at altitude, oxygen delivery, and now we're looking at the comprehensive set of physiological responses. And this is um, led by a guy named Griffith Pugh, P-U-G-H. A lot of the authored papers will be by him as well. Um, he was a ski soldier in, in Lebanon. He knew the cold. He was hired onto the 53 expedition because he had made some specialized stoves and sleeping bags. And he was a, a really good practicing physiologist. So he understood altitude and cold exposure by being in the mountains. Kind of an asshole, apparently. Had a really poor family life, devoted a lot of his time to, uh, to his work, but we don't really care about the family aspect. We only care about the, uh, the science that we get out of his um, Silver Hut series of experiments. So, what kind of stuff are they doing at altitude? At 21,000 feet, experiments were done on the effect of oxygen on ventilation. The subject is doing a step test, breathing oxygen from an open circuit set. A low resistance valve unit was used, and the expired air collected in a lightweight 200 liter bag. The bag was filled above atmospheric pressure and closed with forceps. Pressure and temperature are measured, and volume is then read off a pressure volume chart. So the old school of exercise physiology measurements. You might have done a step test like that before. The um, CSEP guidelines have you do that step test where it speeds up and there's that CD playing in the background. No? All of it is to increase work rate. So it's just like trying to run or riding a cycle ergometer, but it's easier to carry a step up a mountain. And you can just step up and down faster to increase work rate. And then the, uh, the collections that we're looking at, you can see Mike Ward over here is one of the doctors that uh, was on the expedition. There's a good shot. There, so this bag is a Douglas bag. Collects all of the expired air, just like a metabolic cart would do. But you have to make measurements on this manually. So you saw the pressure gauge to measure uh, pressure in the bag. There's um, a little sampling device that allows you to measure O2 and CO2 in the bag. And this open circuit set they're talking about is just like the, uh, the valve and mouthpiece that you wear across the way. You got the mouthpiece in your mouth, air comes in, air goes out. We're just collecting all the air in a bag instead of it being analyzed by a computer. So very similar 
fundamental approach to uh, assessing the physiology of exercise, but just antiquated measurements. And antiquated doesn't necessarily mean worse. These are a lot more portable and uh, I think really give you a nice fundamental understanding of the collection procedure. So Douglas bags, gas collection, stepping up and down on a step, all culminates in papers like this one, Muscular Exercise at Great Altitudes, authored by, so these are all the fellows that are on the paper. Griffith Pugh is this spacey looking guy in the middle. You got Mike Ward, which was uh, the doc holding the bag in the last slide. Jim Millage over on the right. Uh, Mike Gill, John West. Back in the days when being an exercise physiologist or an environmental physiologist was kind of like Indiana Jones, right? You had to go out in the field and actually test yourself against the, uh, the environment rather than create one in a laboratory. Back when you could get funding for tracking Yeti on Mount Everest. And it seems like grant money's all dried up now. So these kinds of papers, muscular exercise at great altitudes, describes the set of physiological responses that can be observed as you move up. And what's the absolute first thing that we're curious about? Gold standard measure of fitness, gold standard measure of the coordinated response to exercise, VO2. Requires ventilation, requires diffusion and transport of oxygen, carrying capacity has to uh, be sufficient, metabolism has to work properly, and we see, maybe surprisingly, that the oxygen requirement is fixed by the workload regardless of altitude. So sea level, all the way down here on the left. Uh, base camp, remember, 5,300 meters. Probably closely approximated by this third middle point. The silver hut at 6,400 meters. And then they would move up to 7,400 meters periodically to do measurements, but then come back down. So they would stay overnight in the silver hut. And you might expect that VO2 would go down as you move to altitude, but that's not the case. VO2 is fixed by workload, regardless of the altitude. So if you're doing 50 watts of exercise, which is 300 kilogram meters per minute, uh, you can just, excuse me, if you just um, correct those two sets um, and convert kilogram meters per minute to watts, 50 watts is right here. It requires about 0.9 liters per minute, whether you're at sea level, whether you're at the uh, Silver Hut, or whether you're at 7,400 meters. 0.9 liters per minute, regardless. So what is it about moving the altitude that makes it so hard to exercise? It's that you can't increase VO2 as high as you would at sea level. So at sea level, you can span this entire range of work rates. You can span this entire range of O2 intakes. But at higher altitudes, you might get one or two workloads in, and that's it. So VO2 is fixed depending on the work rate. But altitude compromises your ability to consume oxygen at a high rate. And that could be any number of things. It could be ventilation, it could be metabolism, it could be cardiac output, it could be hemoglobin, we don't know yet. But altitude compromises your ability to consume oxygen at a high rate. You end earlier. You don't tolerate the workload as well. So even though we uh, just highlighted on the last slide the stair stepper, this is a modular bike that was hiked up the side of the mountain. Um, all of the individual panels were hiked up together. The scientific equipment were hiked up. They were all in individualized packs that had to be assembled. It had to be something a Sherpa could carry. So each Sherpa load was part of a bike or part of the enclosure or a few glass beakers.
And then the number of Sherpas, the number of trips, you saw the boxes piled up with the foodstuffs in them in the first video. Astounding. But allows you to put together a pretty nice comprehensive laboratory at altitude to make these kinds of measurements. So why is, this is essentially VO2 max, why is VO2 max reduced? The maximum capacity to consume oxygen is lower at altitude. Why is VO2 max reduced? And it's reduced by as much as 60% between sea level and moving to altitude. And there's a lot of data on this, uh, on this chart, but I want to draw your attention only to the underlined bits at first. So we have an individual, or this is the average data, I suppose, at sea level, 0.9 liters per minute. That's what we highlighted on the last slide. The uh, oxygen consumption is fixed by the workload, but you can get up to 3.7 liters per minute at sea level. Same group of individuals at 50 watts still consumes 0.9 liters per minute, but they only make it to 1.4. VO2 max is reduced. They only get to two stages instead of six. Why? Um, a few other things to notice on here. What else do we see? Fraction of expired O2 is pretty constant. We're, we're leaving the same amount of oxygen in the breath. We're producing a similar amount of CO2. The fraction of expired CO2 is pretty similar. So the composition of air leaving the body doesn't seem to change a whole lot. Something else must be going on. It really implies that it's the intake side that's compromised. But I want to... Um, point out, I just noticed this this morning actually, in ventilation we've depicted standard temperature and pressure dry, so standardized ventilation. If you were uh, not saturated at sea level, pressure was the same, and this is compared to body temperature and pressure saturated. So body temperature and pressure saturated is what you're actually moving in and out of your body. It depends on the conditions. It depends on heat, depends on humidity. It's the amount of air you can breathe in in one breath. And you can get to 140 liters per minute at sea level and pretty close at altitude. At 7,400 meters, you're breathing 120 liters per minute. So ventilation, when you express it at body temperature and pressure saturated, your lungs have the capacity to move a similar amount of air. It's just that that air is really diffuse. It's really unconcentrated. It's depressurized. If you take the amount of air that you're breathing in at altitude and then you standardize it, it's the equivalent of only 36 liters of sea level air. Because pressures drop so much, the air has expanded fourfold. Right? A liter of air now takes up four liters of space at altitude. And so your lungs are still working, they're breathing in the same volume but it's expanded so much. There's less everything in that volume. So nice to consider the, the difference between standardized air moving in and what the body is actually breathing in at saturated uh, temperature and pressure. Your lungs still work, but the air is expanded so much that it's not actually the same volume you would expect at sea level. So pressure dropping makes air expand. Pressure dropping decreases PO2. And a lower PO2 means you'll have a harder time loading the blood with oxygen. And so we can measure that. We can measure how much oxygen is in the blood at any given point in time. And you've probably seen uh, hemoglobin 
O2 association curve like this. The sigmoidal shape, we're at higher PO2s, more hemoglobin saturated. At sea level, you're almost always 100% saturated. There's no problem with carrying oxygen. At sea level, you've got arterial PO2 of 100, so you're at the right edge of this chart. You're nearly fully saturated. And you stay fully saturated, even if it drops to 60 or 70 millimeters of mercury. The problem at Everest is that it doesn't stop at 60 or 70. It drops to 50. It drops to 48. So we're on this steep portion of the curve. And if we look at O2 saturation, which is how much of the O2, or sorry, how much of the hemoglobin is binding O2, only two-thirds of the possible oxygen is bound. One-third of the spots on hemoglobin doesn't have oxygen bound. You're not carrying oxygen in the blood. And as soon as you start to exercise, that drops even more. So O2 supply in the blood is a serious problem at altitude that probably drives the decrease in VO2 max, the decrease in exercise tolerance. Saturation drops from near complete at sea level down to about two-thirds at altitude, and then as you exercise, it drops even further. And this is kind of interesting because as you exercise, essentially what you're doing is extracting more oxygen out of the blood. You're pulling it out of the blood. And as you pull oxygen out of the blood, it makes the gradient larger. If you pull more oxygen out of the blood and you don't do anything to the air around you, the gradient's larger. And if the gradient's larger, oxygen should move in more readily. What we would expect is not to see a decrease in saturation with exercise. The fact that when you move to exercise and you see this decrease really implies that oxygen is having a hard time getting into the body. Saturation drops, which makes that gradient steeper, and so oxygen should flow in more easily, but it doesn't. Saturation's lower. We measure this. So something might also be wrong with the movement of oxygen into the body. And we'll come back to this a little bit later on, but one of the common um, problems with moving to altitude is fluid buildup in the lungs, edema. And as fluid builds up in the lungs, it, just, it makes the alveolar wall thicker, and it's harder for oxygen to pass through. There might be problems with the capillaries, there might be problems with the actual walls themselves, but for some reason, diffusion is compromised. We'll come back to that a bit later. So loading the blood with oxygen is a serious problem that probably underpins our reduced VO2, our reduced VO2 max. And we can replicate this. We've confirmed this a number of times. These were collected in the Silver Hut series of experiments. There have been a few other expeditions back to Mount Everest since then. Another notable one is AMRI, the American Medical Research Expedition to Everest in 1981. And they're doing a similar set of measurements with similar series of work rates at similar altitudes. And they're trying to get a more comprehensive look at, well, what would happen if you went to the summit and could take the bike with you and then do these uh, measurements at the summit, not just at 7,400 meters, but what happens if you go to 8,400 meters? 
instead of actually going to the summit with a bike, the way that you get around um, those logistical constraints is to modify the percentage of oxygen. Remember, at altitude, there's still 21% oxygen. Compared to sea level, we see the same decrease in arterial saturation when you move to the silver hut levels. And then as you increase the altitude, I'm going to say quote unquote increase the altitude. What we're doing here is artificially decreasing PO2 by decreasing percent of oxygen. This is analogous to 7,400 meters, this open white circle. And then this steep section of open white triangles is analogous to the peak of Mount Everest. So by staying at the silver hut and then breathing hypoxic gas, which I don't know who would be crazy enough to sign up to do that, you're mimicking the conditions of the Everest summit. And so what do we gain by doing this type of um, stressful experiment? We confirm that saturation is decreased at altitude. We confirm that it goes down with exercise. And what we add is that if you were to make these measurements at the summit, there's a further drop in saturation. You might have guessed that, but at least we have concrete numbers to say that's the case there's a greater decrease in saturation and a more precipitous drop. Arterial saturation drops below half with even the mildest forms of exercise at the summit of Mount Everest. And think, if you're in this real world situation, you're climbing a mountain, you're probably doing more than the mildest forms of exercise you're probably in very real danger of this arterial O2 saturation dropping too low, below 40 or 30% even. Let's take a quick break. Digest some of this information. We'll come back and talk about the cardiovascular responses. So these are oxygen, you, uh, our ability to use oxygen and store and carry it in the blood. We'll come back and talk about uh, the blood itself and the ability to pump blood.